I'm actually going to pick up this where Chris left off. Uh, my kids, uh, they do spend all of their time and media viewing time on YouTube. Um, I, on the other hand, uh, grew up with this character. How many, how many in the audience are familiar with this? All right, a few hands. Right, so this is Pippi Longstockings. Uh, the, reason, <clears throat> excuse me, the reason I bring her up is because if you remember the story, she rode into this small, quiet Swedish village on a freckled horse and a monkey on her shoulder. Um, and she was, she was very different, very different from everybody else. She spoke but differently, she behaved differently, she lived life by a different set of rules. Um, and then, interestingly, she went to work First, looking at the children, so, you know, becoming friends with local kids. Let's call them the early adopters, shall we? And then, obviously, slowly but surely winning over the hearts and minds of the rest of the city. Now, we probably, nobody had probably even thought of the term back 75 years ago when Astrid Lindgren came up with Pippi Longstockings. But today, I think we could safely assume that this is what we would <laughs> use to describe her. Uh, now, what I find particularly interesting and why I wanted to start here is because um, she had this beautiful mindset. Uh, so whenever felt faced with a new challenge, she had this thing she used to say, and it's this. I've never tried that before, so I think I can definitely do that, or something like that. Um, it's beautiful, and it's something that's stuck with me for a very long time. Uh, and it's something that really drives much of the things that we do in my company, the Future Group. Um, and a good example, uh, you know, we are, we are a, um, a disruptor in a sense. Uh, we are an innovator in the space of real-time visual effects. And what real-time visual effects really enables us to do is to give to the sort of live media production environment things that previously were reserved for uh, high-budget Hollywood productions. Uh, a good example of, uh, of what this can, can do is a project we did with Fremantle Media a couple of years ago now, um, where we wanted to uh, create a new type of uh, entertainment game show. And the show was called Lost in Time. And essentially what we wanted to do with this was create a stronger and longer-lasting bond between... Uh, the televised event and the individual member of the audience. And how we went about this was, to do, was through interactivity, essentially bringing the audience into the experience, into the action in the studio, and into these fantastic worlds. Now, this required us to, to produce content for two very different platforms, and our solution was game technology, uh, and more specifically the Unreal Engine from Epic Games. And this is the first time... Uh, that the Unreal Engine was really applied towards a large-scale live media production like this. And it serves as a really good example of one of the under, sort of what underpins our company, and it's that we are a technology-driven company, but creative, uh, the creative ambition always stands ahead of our innovation. One of the things that Herb mentioned that we're most, probably most well known for is the work we've done for uh, the Weather Channel. Just briefly going to touch on that as well. So um, weather is interesting because it changes all the time. So the ability to leverage live data is obviously critical. And then it's the, pr <laughs> then it's the presentation itself. Because traditionally, we're used to seeing weather as a very boring map with color codes and things like that. And how do we translate that into the very real impact that especially severe weather can have? And so this is really what the Weather Channel succeeded in doing here, is to bridge that gap, that perception gap of some, a very serious weather situation coming up. And now, all of a sudden, you know, what do you need to do? And actually, the storm surge experience really made people take action. They understood we are really in danger here. We need to take action. So, right, yeah. So there's a uh, few interesting things happening in this industry. And I'll see if I can... Yes, there we go. Perfect. Um, you know, um, in your programs, I'm described as a media disruptor. And, I, you know, I'll leave it up to you to decide whether you think it's true. I, the way I see it, we're merely helping the industry along. But as, you know, as Chris was alluding to, uh, this industry is disrupting itself very effectively. And this uh, actually ties into that. So, so it, in Norway, uh, 
traditional viewership, so viewership of traditional linear television has dropped by 50% in the last two years. That's pretty dramatic. Uh, and it's not just happening to certain demographics, it's happening to all demographics. Uh, and it's not because we're watching less video, because clearly we're watch watching more. Um, and then if you look to, um, to uh, the United States, uh, the number of cable subscribers now terminating their cable subscription, the so-called cord cutters, uh, is expected to rise to 50 million by the year 2021. And interestingly, of the ones who have already cut the cord, if you ask them, uh, do they miss cable television at all? More than half say they miss nothing about cable television. Looking at who the big spenders are on content. So the streaming companies, um, you know, the, the, the Amazons and the Netflixes of the world, this year alone, they're going to spend $25 billion on exclusive content. And that doesn't necessarily mean, I heard you ask the question of whether the CBSs of the world are, are going away, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the traditional players are disappearing from this market, but it certainly, it certainly says something about the sharpening competition. And then there's something equally interesting underway. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and explain this by way of an example. So I'm sure you're all familiar with a game called Fortnite. You know, the, the game responsible for people doing you know, <laughs> interesting dance moves. I know I, that needs work for me, but... <laughs> so Fortnite is, is obviously a very popular game. I think they've surpassed now 200 million players on, uh, on a worldwide basis. Um, but actually, if you ask Epic Games, who owns Fortnite, um, they wouldn't actually call it a game. This picture is a screen grab taken from Inside Fortnite on February 2nd this year. And I'm being date specific because I think this event uh, was a pivotal point in, for one of the trends I believe we'll see going forward. On February 2nd, DJ Marshmallow ha held a concert inside Fortnite, effectively turning Fortnite from being a game into being a concert, a concert arena. The thing was a massive success, I think. 11 million players tuned in, another 7 million watching uh, through streams. Um, and the point I'm trying to make here is that the categories that we're so comfortable in using, especially people my age, we're so using, oh, well, this is a game, and this is a concert, and this is television. They're all blending together. It's all coming together in sort of one big, you know, media and entertainment melting pot. Which brings me to another example of this happening. So um, this is a project we did back in November. Um, uh, it's a project we did for Riot Games. And Riot Games, as I'm sure some of you know, uh, owns League of Legends. And League of Legends is one of the big eSports uh, series. Um, now, every year for the finals, they put on a big show this year in Korea, um, attracting, I don't know, 25, 30,000 people in the physical arena and then another 200 million watching through different kinds of streams. Um, and this year, they wanted to do something special. They have a big opening ceremony. They wanted to introduce a new band. And they did. And the band was a massive success. The song hit the uh, top of the hit list right away. Stay there for weeks. So good for the band, right? Now, what's interesting about this is that that entire thing, this, you know, first of all, the song wasn't created by a DJ or a composer or anything like that. It was created by Riot Games. The game company are now making music. Wow, that's cool. Not impossible, obviously. And then the other thing is that this entire event, the song, the, the, the on-stage performance, the, uh, the video, music video that went along with it, really popular on YouTube, by the way, um, it was part of a marketing stunt. And then the extra interesting thing is that the band does not really exist. It consists of four game characters from League of Legends game. Um, so that's... It's just to show you how sort of this is, this is all working out. So our challenge is this was obviously, well, we want them performing on stage. So you, get, you take four characters out of the game and you put them on stage, and how the hell are you going to do that? So let's see how that went.
around again You want a dose of this right now it's KDA uh. I forgot to speed up blaze So each up on the air and we jump once again That's uh, what Riot Games really did here, I think, is a stroke of genius. Uh, they created something that was really authentic to the League of Legends property, and I think that's a prerequisite for anything that's really going to grab, um, grab attention on, on YouTube or other distribution channels. Um, and they did it in a way that didn't sort of compromise the format. Um, weaving everything together very elegantly, so there's marketing in there, there's entertainment in there, there's game evolution in there, and there's celebration in there. Sort of all come together in one nice big package. Um, so a very interesting thing. So um, I had a conversation with Herb actually a few weeks ago, and he asked me, you know, what do you think the future of media is going to look like? I told him I had no idea. <laughs> um, what I do have some thoughts about is uh, what it will technologically require to stay relevant in the industry. And what types of technologies will sort of be the support of this industry going forward. And I think, as always, you know, any technology that you bring to this market needs to be live capable. So this is where real-time visual effects come into play. It is live capable. And live, live content captures a bigger audience and generates more revenue than anything else. So that's obviously a given. And second, I think it needs to be connected. We need to feel, uh, we need to have the ability to extract data from the production environment and put, use that elsewhere and reversely take external data, feed that back into the production environment. And that could be easy stuff like stock market information or weather information or whatever, but it could also be live, real-time audience engagement data. And to leverage that data, I think we'll see more and more of virtual production. So the few examples I've shown you here is obviously part of that. 
uh, either full virtual studio productions or augmented reality productions, uh, because it enables us to essentially leverage the engagement data. And then I believe that the platforms of the future will be based on open structures. So typically in our, in our space, things are normally quite sort of locked down. You have one vendor, that's fine. Uh, there's a great deal of innovation going on in this space. Uh, it's moving breathtakingly fast. And I think to leverage all of that fantastic innovation, you need to be uh, open-based. What I didn't mention here is artificial intelligence, uh, deep learning. Uh, it's already here. Um, we have deep learning-based tracking and matting solutions, for those of you who are familiar with the terms. I'm not going to explain them, sorry. <laughs> um, and there's computer vision-based uh, motion tracking and digital humans. And these are technologies that are not sort of, well, we'll see them sometime, you know, 10 years from now. These are already here, or they're right around the corner. And I think they'll have a profound impact on the media and entertainment industry. Just take a look at this guy. This is a Chinese virtual news presenter. So it's being driven by a computer, somebody typing in what it's supposed to say, and then that comes out as speech. Now, he even sounds real. I've turned off the sound here. But the point I'm trying to make here is, you know, he does lack that sort of final human touch and some mannerisms and stuff like that, but he will withstand the casual glance. And I'm using this as a segue to my closing remarks, which revolve around ethics. Because I think, you know, we're, we're coming to the point where we essentially now we can create anything. So we could quite easily, in a live production environment, we could, you know, fake a plane crash. Or we could have a building explode. Or we could fake a um, natural disaster. With digital humans, we're coming to the point where we can have anyone be anywhere and say anything. And I think this is something that we, we absolutely need to be aware of. In this world of, of fake news and whatever, we need to know that as exciting as all of these modern, <coughs> excuse me, modern production tools are, they do have a darker side. And I, I think that's something we absolutely need to be aware of as an audience and as producers of content. Or as you said, Chris, with great power comes great responsibility. With that, it's time for me to end. Thank you very much.